for standing behind the pillar. Uh, good morning to you all. Cairo is not a city for early risers. Uh, aside from school children, the streets tend to be empty before 9 a.m., to the extent that a Cairo street is really ever empty. And as you all know, it's much easier to buy milk at 11 p.m. than it is at 8 a.m. So I'm very grateful that you're all here to join us relatively early on this Saturday morning for this highly anticipated lecture. It's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the American University in Cairo's Department of Arab and Islamic Civilizations to the first of two lectures delivered by this year's Bayard Dodge Distinguished Visiting Professor of Arabic Studies, Professor Marina Rostow. Professor Rostow comes to us from Princeton University, where she holds the Khadouri A. Zilka Chair of Jewish Civilization in the Near East and directs the Princeton Geniza Lab. Professor Rostow received her BA from Yale University and then moved to Columbia, where she completed two master's degrees and a PhD. During her graduate work, she received training in Geniza research at Princeton, and it's in that field that she has built her formidable reputation as a historian. Professor Rostow taught at Emory and Johns Hopkins before being elected to her Princeton chair in 2015. In 2015, Professor Rostow was also named a MacArthur Fellow, uh, the most prestigious prize a researcher in the humanities can receive, and this came only a year after she received the uh, Guggenheim Fellowship. Not too shabby. Her first book, Heresy in the Politics of Community, The Jews of the Fatimid Caliphate, was published in 2008, and she is currently completing her latest book, A Reevaluation of the Fatimid Imperial Administration. This will be the subject of her lecture uh, this Tuesday evening in the same hall at 6 p.m., and I hope you can all join us then. Today we turn to the Geniza, one of the most important sources for Jewish history, Egyptian history, and indeed the history of the global Middle Ages. As you all know, the Geniza archive is not easily accessible to historians working in Egypt. It was stolen or removed in dubious circumstances by Europeans, along with so many other Egyptian treasures more than a century ago. We scholars today, those of us based here and those of us working in wealthy North American and European institutions that have profited greatly from theft, slavery, and other historical sins, must confront the reality behind the circumstances of our work. Yet we cannot deny that the Geniza would likely not have received the attention it has received thus far if it had remained in Egypt. Those who stole it have taken very good care of it. And Professor Rusta will focus today in her talk on new digital tools that have the potential of redeeming this historical crime, at least in part. The Geniza can return to Cairo, at least digitally, and indeed it can be made available to researchers around the world. And I know that the story of the Geniza has the whiff of history, but it has profound resonance today. Arabic manuscripts are routinely stolen from Darul Qutub to be sold to wealthy buyers in the Gulf. Artworks and artifacts of great value and importance have disappeared from our museums, and countless historical buildings are suffering from neglect and despair. Uh, disrepair, sorry. We often talk about the Geniza or the bust of Nefertiti, but we mustn't forget that we are losing tens or perhaps hundreds of Genizas each year to theft and neglect. But I've gone on for too long already. Um, let me please ask you to turn off your mobile phones and to help me welcome our esteemed guest and 2017 Spired Dodge Visiting Professor of Arabic Studies, Professor Marina Rusta. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, Adam, for the introduction. Uh, thanks to my hosts for bringing me here, especially Adam, but there are many other people who went into making this visit possible some of whom I will probably not even meet while I'm here. I'm super grateful. It takes a village, I know, to bring somebody from abroad. Um, and thanks to all of you for, for coming and for your interest in the subject of the Cairo Geniza. Um, when I get excited about what I'm talking about, I have a tendency to speak quickly. I'm also from New York City, and New Yorkers, probably like Kyrenes, are famous for speaking very quickly. So if I'm speaking too quickly, like wave or do something, and I will slow down. Um, I'm very, very happy to be in Cairo for many reasons, not the least of which is that I spend the vast majority of my working hours mentally in Cairo. So it's very nice to be here physically as well. What I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna give you a very brief background on the Cairo Geniza for those of you who have not worked on it um, previously. Um, then I'm going to talk about some of the technical challenges involved in working on this material. And then I'm going to introduce two of the digital tools that have become available for researchers in recent years. 
Um, and that will serve as an introduction um, to the workshop also that I'm giving this afternoon. So the, the Cairo Geniza, simply put, was a repository for disused texts. Um, the, the word Geniza comes from the Hebrew Beit Geniza, which is simply a place where you keep texts that are too worn out to be useful anymore on the reasoning that anything with Hebrew script on it has the potential to be wholly writ. So the alphabet itself is considered to have a certain sacredness and you can't simply discard manuscripts in Hebrew. The reality is that if you go into the Talmud, which is one of the main sources of Jewish law um, from late antiquity, and you look at the rules of how to dispose of worn manuscripts, they don't say put them in a Beit Geniza. They usually say you can burn them. So clearly there was some fluctuation, some change in the way in which manuscripts were treated over the centuries. I suspect that were we able to transport ourselves back to Cairo in the 11th and 12th centuries and walk down the street and find some Jewish person and say, why do you put your manuscripts in that room in your synagogue? They would probably say, I don't really know because I saw my father doing that and I saw his father doing that. There may in fact be as many reasons for discarding manuscripts there as there were Jews in Cairo. The synagogue where uh, the Geniza was found, um, although it was you know, found only from the perspective of Europeans, because of course those who were there knew it was there all along, um, is in Fustat, the residential quarter um, of Cairo until the Mamluk period. I'm saying this to remind those of you who don't constantly think about what your city was like in the Fatimid period. Um, in the Fatimid period, there was a separation between the residential quarter where most people lived and, uh, and Cairo properly speaking, Al Qahira, which was um, the palace complex of the Fatimids. The synagogue was built between 1025 and 1041. Um, it was demolished to the ground in 1893. The roof of the, of the synagogue collapsed in 1888, and at that point the community said, we need to build ourselves a new synagogue. And at that point, the manuscripts were taken out of the Geniza chamber and put into the courtyard which is obviously not an ideal storage condition um, for manuscripts. And it was from there that many antiquities dealers, and don't forget this is the era when pharaonic treasures were reaching the antiquities markets in great numbers, as well as papyri. So from the courtyard, dealers were able to um, take large numbers of manuscripts and sell them to individual collectors and also to libraries. Um, that accounts for about a third of what was in the Geniza chamber, and the other two-thirds was finally taken by Solomon Schechter to Cambridge in 1897. The synagogue where the Geniza was found, which if, uh, if, there, if there's anybody here who hasn't visited it, it's really worthwhile. It's a beautiful example of late 19th century um, Egyptian craftsmanship, not unlike this room. Um, very, very beautiful. Um, today it's known as the Ibn Azra Synagogue, but back in the day it was known as Keniset the Shemiyin, um, the synagogue of, it's actually not so clear how you want to translate Shemiyin. We would say Syrians, but in fact this was the Jewish community that traced its liturgical tradition back to Jerusalem. There uh, was also an Iraqi community which traced its traditions back to Baghdad and to the rabbinic colleges um, on the Euphrates River before they moved to Baghdad. And then there were the Karaites. And any, Cairo was not unique, or Fustat was not unique in having three separate Jewish communities which came together for various purposes as one community. Any large city around the Mediterranean basin had these same three Jewish communities. 
The, the letter that I'm showing you now, which is currently at the Cambridge University Library, is written in Judeo-Arabic. Judeo-Arabic is Arabic, I'm gonna say it simply and then I'll tell you the complexities, Arabic written in Hebrew letters. In reality, it's complicated because Judeo-Arabic can occupy any point along a spectrum between Amiya and Fusha. So if you read the Judeo-Arabic of Moses Maimonides, the great philosopher of the 12th century, it's perfect Fusha. Whereas if you look at this letter and if you were to transcribe it into Arabic characters, uh, your uh, composition teachers from grammar school might be horrified by, by what they see. Um, what that also means is that Judeo-Arabic is um, a very, very interesting source for the history of the Arabic language. Um, the Jews did not speak a different dialect from other people. It's simply that we have more documents written in the dialect by Jews. But as Arabic texts on papyrus um, begin to be worked on more and more intensively, what's become clear is that Judeo-Arabic is simply what's called Middle Arabic, which is, again, somewhere along that spectrum between Fusha and Amiya. Um, and so Arabic script documents were also written in this. I would call it a documentary language as opposed to a high literary language. The contents of the Cairo Geniza date from the earliest uh, text is probably from the ninth century, and uh, people continued to put manuscripts into the Geniza chamber up until the day it was finally emptied in 1897. So we have a span of about a thousand years, but by far the most dense and intensive period of deposit was between 950 and 1250, so covering the Fatimid and the Ayyubid periods. All in all, the current total, and now nobody's actually sat and counted all the manuscripts, but because they have, um, or they're in the process of being digitally imaged, there is a sense of the numbers. And so the figure is 350,000. In reality, there is a problem with how do you count. So if you have a manuscript that's a single page, clearly that counts as one page. But if you have what codicologists would call a bifolio, do you count this as one page or two? And in reality, when we look at this figure, we have no idea how they counted. So any figure, you have to take the numbers with a grain of salt. It's never going to be an exact science. But this is just to give you a sense of the scope and the scale. So theoretically, you would expect Geniza manuscripts to be in Hebrew script. But in reality, first of all, there were parallel customs in the Middle East for texts, depositing texts in other alphabets, including Arabic, in a similar way. And in practice, the people who put their manuscripts in the Geniza were not very, um, not very exacting about which alphabets they put in. So there have been manuscripts found in the Geniza in Georgian, in Latin, in Greek, in Old Church Slavonic, and then this was a, a new one for me. I'm not sure we can actually access this via internet. Um, maybe I'll show it this afternoon. But there is a, a manuscript from the 18th century in Karamanla, which is Turkish, Ottoman Turkish, written in Greek characters. So you really have all kinds of things in the Geniza and um, not just Hebrew script. Most of what has been found in the Geniza are books. I'm putting books in quotation marks because the book in the Middle Ages could occupy any of a number of formats. You could have the book like we know it today, the codex, right, with pages that you turn and a spine, pages bound together. You could have horizontal scrolls, so uh, the, the Torah is written on a horizontal scroll on one side, um, so written only on recto, not on verso in parallel columns. And then you could have a vertical scroll. So what is known among codicologists as a rotulus, simply the Latin word for a long vertical scroll in which you write the text parallel to the short side of the page. It's a very, very common form, obviously, for documents, but also for copying books. 
especially if the book that you were copying was something for your own personal use. If you had no intention of sharing that book with other people, you simply found a text that you, that you thought was interesting on the shelf of somebody's library and you wanted to copy some passages for yourself, generally the form that you would use is the rotalist form. So we have many books um, in that format as well. This is an example of a fragmentary book. It also shows you the complexity of these manuscripts and of manuscript culture in the Middle Ages. The, the Hebrew text that you're looking at is um, a midrash. So uh, the midrash is um, a very, very large and vast collection of oral commentaries and interpretations of the Bible that developed over a period of about a thousand years between the first century and the 10th century. And this is one of the earlier midrashim. Now, I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting. It took me a few moments to realize what was going on here. But this Hebrew text was actually written on top of a Greek text. Can you see the Greek text? Let me zoom in for you. It's usually easier to see if you take a blank part of the parchment. There you go, you can see a little bit of the remnants of a Greek text, which turns out to be the New Testament in Greek. And from the handwriting, it's clear that this is quite early. This is a sixth century New Testament text. So this is a palimpsest. A palimpsest is any writing surface, usually parchment, that has been scraped clean or washed and reused. And palimpsests are one of the most interesting areas of research in Geniza studies because they yield much, much older texts than we would normally have. They also suggest that the manuscript culture in the Middle Ages was not strictly divided by religion. So there are many Jewish scribes who reused Christian texts. And you ask yourself, did they actually own these Christian texts or were they going to the market and buying used parchments? Not totally clear, but interesting to think about. This is another example of a book from the Geniza. This is Kalila wa Dimna. Um, so an example of something that's written in, uh, in Arabic script that was found in the Geniza. The illustration is, uh, is quite lovely, as you can see. So that's most of the Geniza. About 89% of the total are books. Now, what's the other 11%? The other 11% are documents. If I had given this lecture to you in this room 10 years ago, I would have said that there were between 10 and 15,000 documents in the Geniza. The figure that I'm giving you now is double that because it turns out there are many, many more documents than anyone thought. Now, 10% might not seem like a lot compared with this vast total, but 32,000 documents is quite a bit for the period. Um, my colleagues who are medievalists who deal with European archives, it's rare for them to have this number of documents from a single community, almost unheard of. So this is something very, very special. So I work on documents. Um, I'm a social historian, and so that's what I find the most exciting. Um, so what is a document? So a document can be a letter, a legal deed, in other words, a contract or a testimony drawn up in a court of law, um, a list or an account. Now, I'm giving you a simple list of four kinds of document, but you should know that it took me and about 15 other people five years to come up with this list because we originally started with a list of about 200 document types and we gradually distilled it um, until we decided, okay, we're gonna use the simplest possible categorization and then we can get into the details you know, another time. Um, what does this mean in practice? It means that you can have amulets, you can have petitions to caliphs, you can have letters from wives to their husbands, and you can even have doodles, little drawings. Um, I actually collect these little drawings, I mean not physically, but I collect digital images of little drawings because I find it fascinating to see how people in the Middle Ages would pass the time when they were bored. Um, this drawing is particularly interesting because it quotes some verses um, from the poet Zauzani, who, um, who was a, a, 
a fifth or 11th century um, poet, and this is transcribed into Hebrew characters. Um, as you can see, it's about an emir, um, al Hassan, in procession. Um, and so you wonder, well, what, what's going on in the drawing here? It seems that you have an elephant, not particularly well drawn. Elephant spines are usually not that flat. Um, and what's going on on top of the elephant's head is actually a Hebrew letter, right? So that's not part of the elephant. And then next to the elephant, you see what looks like scales of justice. So when I saw this fragment, I asked myself, I wonder if this has to do with the procedure by which state officials would hear petitions when they were in procession. Of course, we'll never know what was in the mind of the scribe, but it's interesting to think about. It shows that Jews were reading and probably memorizing Arabic poetry. Um, moreover, we have an enormous amount of information on daily life. So I can't actually tell you what color clothing the scribe was wearing the day he wrote this note, but I can give you a reasonable approximation, and I can also tell you what he ate for his late breakfast that day. There were other Genizot uh, in the medieval Islamic world, um, which makes sense because 90% of Jews in the world lived in the Islamic world in the Middle Ages. But the Cairo Geniza was by far the densest, the most coherent, and the oldest to have survived. The story of the, of the, of the encounter between um, European scholars, local manuscript dealers, and the Cairo Geniza is a very, very interesting one, and it's told extremely well in this book called Sacred Trash. The main motor, when you read this book, you see that the main motivation people had for looking at Geniza texts was that they wanted to understand the history of the Hebrew Bible. Documents did not become interesting to anyone until the 1950s, and they became interesting basically because of one man, Shlomo Dov Goitain. Um, he's the author of a five-volume work on the Mediterranean and Egypt in light of Geniza documents. He also planned, but never finished, a seven-volume work on the India trade in the Middle Ages, which four volumes have now been published by one of his students. And it's, going, it's not an exaggeration to say that it's going to revolutionize what we know about the Indian Ocean in the pre-modern period. So Goitain can rightly be considered the grandfather of documentary Geniza studies. Why were scholars who've worked on the documentary Geniza, beginning with Goitain in the early 50s, so excited about writing history from below? This is information of a type completely unknown before the decipherment of Geniza documents. Before the Geniza, Middle East history had to be written from chronicles, works of law, and so forth that heavily favored a very specific part of the population, those who were male, those who lived in cities, those who were literate, usually those who were Muslim, and it was rare to read about anybody else. So we knew next to nothing about women, about trade and commodities, about farming and rural life, about systems of land tenure, about taxation, especially taxation from the point of view of the people being taxed, but even the tax collectors, it was not so clear. Um, we knew nothing about children, and children are an extremely important subject for any social historian, because this is how you find out how social values are being reproduced. And we knew nothing about the population of slaves, just to give some examples. As a result of Goitain's work and the work of his students and their students, we now know a lot of interesting facts about daily life in the Middle Ages. For example, takeaway food. So Cairo is uh, famous, not just in Cairo, for being the international capital of takeaway food. Um, there was an article in the New York Times a couple of months ago about how you can order anything to your home in Cairo. I have personally experienced it. Um, it turns out that that's not new, that in the period of the Geniza, takeaway food was a really big thing. Um, you would go to the market, you would take your own sort of like, uh, you know, 
set of containers and you would get warm food and you would go and eat it wherever you would eat it, at work, at home. Because the last place that you wanted to involve yourself in cooking with fire was your house, simply too dangerous. We know about houses in medieval Fustat. There's a famous passage in the fourth volume of a Mediterranean society where Goitain goes on for literally 30 pages and it's a walkthrough of a medieval house and you feel that you're in the house when you read this description. Goitain was able to write this description because he had read hundreds and hundreds of legal documents which were real estate sales where you described the boundaries of the property and what it looked like and then he filled in the information from letters and as a result you really feel that you're in a house when you read this, this passage. We know about marriage. We know that the rate of divorce was astonishingly high among the Jews of Fustat, possibly as much as 40% compared to, uh, by some estimates. Um, we know how Jews actually ran their, their communal life. It was not always peaceful. Um, there was a lot of uh, debate and a lot of uh, politicking, as there would be in any community. And we also know quite a bit about trade in the Mediterranean. It used to be thought that Mediterranean trade was um, fancy commodities like silk and uh, spices and gold and so forth. It turns out that the vast majority of what was traded was flax, right? So not very glamorous, but very, very important to the medieval economy. So now we have a much better sense of what the economy really was. And then, as I mentioned before, um, the history of the India trade is going to be completely rewritten based on Geniza documents. This is a Judeo-Arabic letter from a Jewish trader in Aden to uh, one of his uh, trading associates on, uh, in the southwestern part of India, Mangalore. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds, possibly over a thousand, of these letters that have survived. So this has all been very good, not just for Jewish history, but also for Middle East history, because the documents of the Geniza provide information in precisely the areas where religious differences were least significant, such as trade and daily life. So anything that you learned about Jews could also tell you quite a bit about Muslims and Christians. There's one neglected, er there are many neglected areas of research, but there's one that interests me in particular, and that is Arabic script documents from the Geniza. There's one absolutely wonderful book of editions of some of the Arabic documents from the Fatimid and Ayyubid periods by Jeffrey Kahn at Cambridge. He published uh, 69 documents from Qadi courts and about 100, I think 90 something documents that were produced in the various offices of the Fatimid and the Ayyubid governments. This is a type of information that had been completely unknown before him. There are also many state documents in Arabic as well as Qadi court documents from the Mamluk and the Ottoman periods and those um, have not yet found their scholar. When I uh, started studying Arabic script documents, I thought, well, surely Jeffrey Kahn with 190 Arabic script documents from a relatively constrained period, just two centuries, surely he's done everything that needs to be done. Boy, was I wrong. Over the last five to seven years, I've been uh, building a database of Arabic documents only from the Fatimid state meaning from Fatimid government offices. And right now, the database is at about 1,500 unpublished texts. And this is before my colleagues and I have gone through um, the vast riches of the Cambridge Geniza collection. Okay, so this brings me to, in other words, you get a sense here, there's, there's always in Geniza studies a kind of optical illusion. My teacher, Mark Cohen, used to call Goitain's Mediterranean society a kind of optical illusion in the sense that you look at five volumes, thousands of texts, and you think, we're done. Goitain did everything. And then you realize that no, Goitain 
quoted 5,000 documents, but there are 32,000 documents. There's much more to be done. I had the same experience with Jeffrey Kahn. I thought, surely he's done everything, but no. There's always a much deeper pool than you think there is. But the question is how to find the documents. So that brings me to the next part of my lecture, which is the technical challenges that are involved in finding and studying Geniza material. The Geniza was not an archive. So what is an archive? An archive is a collection of documents that are organized for the purposes of not just storage, but also retrieval. It has to be organized because otherwise you'll never be able to find what you're looking for. The Geniza was not organized and there was no system of retrieval. Once manuscripts went into the Geniza chamber, they stayed there. So whereas most historians dig around in archives and find groups of related documents, so you'll go to, um, you'll go to the archive of a particular Qadi court, let's say, and you find all the cases that were heard in the year 1527. And this gives you a real slice of what was this court doing in 1527 in a particular neighborhood. That's typical archival labor for a historian. We, in the Geniza world, have to bring related documents together. There's a technical distinction in the world of document studies between an archive and a dossier. So I'm using the word archive in two slightly different ways. What I've just spoken to you about is a modern archive, right? Historians go to the archive and they find their documents and usually their documents that are related that will be sitting close to each other in the archive. The term archive also means a group of documents that were organized for storage and retrieval in the Middle Ages, in other words, in the historical period that you're studying. So, um, for example, my team of collaborators and I um, discovered 36 tax receipts from the early Fatimid period for a single tax farmer written by a single um, jahbaz. And this was clearly from somebody's archive back in the Middle Ages. But the other way of assembling documents is to assemble them into a dossier. And a dossier is a group of documents related to a particular person or a particular topic, but documents that could come from everywhere and that were never in an archive back in the Middle Ages. So you have to assemble groups of documents. They're not simply handed to you. And finding the documents is not enough. Before you can write history, you have to come to grips with the fact that many of these texts are fragments. A join is a match between one part of a manuscript and another. Sometimes the parts are in the same library, sometimes they're in two different libraries. A page, a single page, can be divided by an ocean. Um, in this case, we have seven pieces of a single rotulus stored in three libraries on two continents. Um, this was a join that was made by a scholar named Ronnie Schweka, who um, was looking for this particular um, text. It's an 8th century Iraqi Jewish legal text. This copy is from the 11th century. And he found 120 fragments of this in the Geniza and was able to put together this. Actually, he put together the first six. And the top one came to him when a graduate student in Frankfurt wrote him an email and said, I was looking at your article on this text and I started uh, looking around for things I knew that were similar and I think I found another piece of it. And this is obviously very exciting um, for everybody. There are more than 70 collections of Geniza material, 54 collections in libraries, 17 private collections, usually not owned by individuals but owned by synagogues and the like. Um, and there are many techniques involved with working with such a complex source base. So the largest collection by far is at Cambridge, 200,000 more or less. Um, the second largest is at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City, um, 43,000 um, pages of which 7,000 were sitting in boxes uncatalogued until two years ago. Um, I was uh, sent photographs of some of these boxes before they were cataloged. 
And I could immediately tell in one box there was a tax receipt from the same Fatimid archive I was just telling you about. I recognized the hand of the Jahbad, and I wrote to the curator, and I said, can you please, please, like, iron that one out and photograph it so I can see it. Um, you, you never know what you find among what other people have deemed to be uninteresting. So you have to find the texts. And once you've found the texts, you have to join fragmentary texts. Once you've done that, you have to decipher them, which is not always easy. Um, just to give you an example of some of the paleographic challenges, here are three of the tax receipts that I was telling you about. So in technical terms, we would say that the challenges of these tax receipts are, first of all, the fact that they're unpointed. There are no dots. Usually you can get around that if you know more or less what the writer is trying to say. And a term I find really funny, abusive ligatures, meaning uh, letters that are joined together that shouldn't be joined together. For example, joining the elif to the letter next to it. You can see that the scribe was writing very quickly didn't want to lift the pen very much, probably had many, many tax receipts to write. And in fact, in each of these receipts, you're looking at five different scribes with their handwriting on the page. If anyone is interested in that, I can talk about it for hours, but I'm not gonna do that now. Um, I just wanna give you a sense of the challenges. And then once you decipher the text, there's also the issue of language. It's not always obvious what an Arabic word that you might know perfectly well means in the context because it was used completely differently a thousand years ago in a particular documentary <clears throat> context. Even if you've understood every word on the page, your, your, your writers are in the middle of a conversation. If you have a letter from a wife to her husband, her husband's off in India, she's in Fustat, and she says, you know, when are you coming home? And she's updating him with information you don't necessarily know what they're talking about, right? It's like overhearing a conversation. You just hear tidbits and you don't necessarily know the context, which means the more documents you read, the better you're going to be able to reconstruct the context. And then of course there's that minor question of historical significance. Why is this text interesting at all? And that is actually the most difficult part of being a historian. Um, Okay, so what I'm gonna do is focus just on these first two issues, finding the texts and finding the joins, because this is where digitization has made the biggest difference in the way we work. I'm gonna talk about two electronic resources in chronological order of when they were founded. The first one is the Princeton Geniza Project, which was founded in 1986. And the second one is the Friedberg Geniza Project, which was founded in the early 2000s. So I will probably be using the acronyms a lot, PGP and FGP, just to warn you. <laughs> Confusing, but, um, but that's how it is. Okay, so first, the Princeton Geniza Project. This is a photograph um, my, my assistant sent this to me uh, last night in a text message. I said to her, it'd be nice to, to show everybody in Cairo a picture of the new Princeton Geniza Lab. And the reason I'm particularly happy with this space is that the old Geniza Lab was in a renovated janitorial closet. You could barely fit three people in it. It's a space that I love. I spent a lot of time there as a graduate student. Many graduate students at Princeton love this little closet. We still keep many books in the little closet, but now we have a bigger space, and that makes, that makes me very happy. The reason for the existence of the Princeton Geniza Lab is to preserve the interim products of research on the Geniza. So what do I mean by that? Inevitably, with such a large and fragmentary mass of material, you can't publish everything you find. So, um, Goytime in a Mediterranean society quotes maybe 5,000 documents, of which maybe he published in proper editions 200, something like that. If he had published everything, he never would have written a Mediterranean society, and that wasn't um, the way he worked. So you can't publish everything you find or everything that you find interesting. 
But at the same time, you don't want to just leave it aside because maybe somebody else can use it. Maybe somebody else can understand better than you can why it's interesting or what it's trying to say. The way scholars work is they keep what's called hand lists, so their own personal lists of documents that they work on um, or manuscripts in general. So I, I showed you my database of Arabic script documents from the Fatimid period. It's a little bit like showing you my toothbrush. Um, they're messy, they're useful, they're very personal, and you never know when somebody might actually need to use it. So what we try to do is to store the interim products of scholarly research and make them available to anyone who's working seriously on Geniza documents. We focus only on the documentary part of the Geniza, okay, so that has always been Princeton's specialty, just the documents. And I want to emphasize, especially here, that we have no original documents. We, ha we don't have a single original Geniza document at Princeton University. There is one Geniza document in Princeton, New Jersey, and it's at the Princeton Theological Seminary, which is a separate institution. It happens to be a document and a very interesting one, but we have always worked from photographs, microfilms, and other people's editions. So you can actually do a lot of work even without the manuscripts on hand, obviously much more now in the digital age. Okay, so the lab, the Princeton Geniza lab was started um, when Goitain died in 1985. Goitain had uh, moved, um, he, so he was born in Bavaria in Germany in 1900. He moved to Palestine in 1923. He became aware of the documents from the Geniza in 1947. He was on a trip to Budapest and he was already 47 years old and had had a career as an Arabist. Um, he read a letter from the India trade and decided that he wanted to spend the rest of his life working on these documents which he proceeded then to do. Goitain moved to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia in 1957. He retired in 1970 and spent hit the 15 years of his retirement in Princeton, New Jersey, not at the university, but at the Institute for Advanced Studies, which is a separate institution. When Goitain died in 1985, there was a question of what to do with what he called his lab. So his lab was his set of index cards. Um, I'll be showing you some index cards in a moment. Actually, no, I'll be showing you index cards right now. Um, when, so Goitain had something like 24,000 index cards when he died. And each index card had on it a summary of a document or else a topic and several documents that you could use to reconstruct this topic. When you're very, very lucky, the index cards are typed, but that's in the minority of cases. In the beginning, he started out typing them, and then, like the Jahbad writing the tax receipts, he went faster and faster and got more and more illegible. So that, and actually his Arabic is pretty clear. His Hebrew is also clear. The problem is when he's writing in English, it's really impossible to read his handwriting. So most of them are handwritten and you have to stare at them for a little while before figuring out what they say. These 24,000 index cards are a gold mine. Goitain himself used to say that the five volumes of a Mediterranean society were just a sketch. There are dozens of other sketches that he never published and the only way to know what those are is to look at his laboratory material. He also left unpublished transcriptions. To this day, nobody knows how many. Um, we have about 2,000 that have been digitized, but when I came to Princeton, I discovered that, that, that in fact there are more in the files of the Geniza lab, which we will eventually digitize. He also had translations, and his translations have never before been published. Um, in the first three volumes, he talks about a separate book called Mediterranean People. He never published that book. That book could probably be published tomorrow, except that I think it's more important to put the information online so that it's available to everybody. After Goitain's death, the lab became something much bigger. 
because of the vision of Mark Cohen and Avram Yudovich, um, who in 1986, before, really before anyone owned a personal computer, they realized that if you digitized the transcriptions, Goitain's transcriptions, you could make them word searchable. And that would obviously be very, very helpful to scholars. I can't emphasize enough how heroic this was. A whole generation of us could not have written our dissertations without the Princeton Geniza Project database. In the end, Mark Cohen, under his directorship, the PGP digitized 4,350 documents, not just Goitain's editions, they also moved on to the editions of other scholars. However, there's much, much more work to do. Um, this is a, a screenshot of the Princeton Geniza project as you will find it today, but it's not going to look this way for much longer because we have a replacement for it in the works behind the scenes. When I came to Princeton a year and a half ago, I shifted directions. Uh, Mark Cohen's emphasis had been on transcriptions only meaning that it was a database that could only be used by specialists who already knew Hebrew, Judeo-Arabic, and something about how to navigate Geniza documents. I would like these documents to be available to not just specialists. At the same time, I'm very, very curious what lies beyond the 4,350 documents already in the database. So together with my colleague, Eve Krakowski, we're digging deeper into unpublished manuscripts with the goal, and this could take us 20 years, of systematically going through all the collections and at least identifying the documents, describing them. Descriptions are very important. A three sentence description of what's going on in a document can make all the difference to scholarship. And only then, once we have a sense of the whole, at that point, we can start taking meaningful, related groups of documents and transcribing them and translating them as well so that they can be used by more than just specialists. So the old PGP, the, the basic footprint, the, the remit of the database was Goitain's lab and the publications of Goitain's students. The new PGP, what we'd like to do is expand to all 32,000 documents. Maybe there are more, maybe there are 50,000, but ask me in 10 years. Um, the, the number of descriptions in the old PGP was actually fewer than transcriptions. So you would have this kind of strange experience of going to PGP, looking at a transcription, and having absolutely no idea what was in there until you had read it, which is not usually the way libraries work. Usually the, the way they work is that if you're gonna transcribe something, you also have a description. So we've reversed the emphasis. And what we're doing is trying to describe as many documents as possible and worry about transcribing them later. We're still maintaining the element of text searchability. We're adding translations. And, and this is really the, the part that I'm most excited about right now images of Goitain's original lab material, so that when you click on a document, you can get an image of Goitain's index card, and you can know whether he has a transcription and a translation. It used to be that the only way to know that was to come to Princeton, New Jersey, and go through the famous white filing cabinet where all of Goitain's papers were kept, but that will no longer be necessary. So this is hopefully how it's gonna look in the end. Um, the identified documents will be some subset of all Geniza manuscripts. The described documents will be a subset of that, and the transcribed and translated will be a subset of that. So that's what the Princeton Geniza project is. It's only documents. We focus on mapping the entire documentary Geniza. Um, we focus on making available the interim products of research, and, and this is maybe the most important part of what we do. We focus on collaboration. We work together, we like to work with other scholars, we like to facilitate collaboration. So this is no longer the heroic age of the individual scholar sitting in his, usually his study by himself, but rather this is a number of people working together. If you have a tax receipt and it's written on the back of a petition, 
You need to go to your friend who's an expert in petitions and say, what's going on in this petition exactly? You need to work together for any fragmentary corpus. That email from a graduate student in Frankfurt, right? That could not have happened 30 years ago. Um, there's always gonna be information out there spread among your colleagues, and the only way to really get a sense of what's in this fantastic cache of documents is for people to talk to each other and to work together. Luckily, we're very nice people, um, so we like to share. Uh, we're also overwhelmed by information, so we don't mind giving some of it away before it's published. And more importantly, we all understand that there's no way to grasp a single domain of document without also understanding some of the others. That brings me to the final part of my talk on the Friedberg Geniza project. So while the Princeton Geniza project deals with 32,000 documents and counting, the Friedberg Geniza project deals with the entire Geniza cache, even a little bit beyond the Geniza, because often what you'll find in collections and libraries is manuscripts that are cataloged as being from the Cairo Geniza that it's pretty clear once you study the situation more closely were in fact not from the Cairo Geniza at all, right? But that's inevitable in, uh, in when you're dealing with libraries who acquired manuscripts sometimes from dealers, often they had no idea where they came from. So there's a lot of presumed Geniza material in FGP. The Friedberg Geniza database was developed by a computational linguist named Jakub Schweika, who grew up in Cairo and then moved to Jerusalem when he was 19 years old in 1951. This is somebody who has won multiple prizes and awards for his work in computational linguistics, but it turns out that his native language is the Judeo-Arabic of Cairo. So what better person to work on this project? He was the technical director of FGP for more than 10 years and just retired um, less than one year ago. And without him, this project could never have come to fruition. So here's what FGP does. They do images. So it's because of their efforts literally going around all over the world from library to library and saying, can we photograph your Geniza manuscripts? We will pay for them to be photographed. Either we photograph them or you use your photographers, whatever makes you happy, we just want the photographs. So they managed to get photographs from every major Geniza collection in the world, which is um, saying quite a bit. And that was, I mean, I saw this happen. That was Schweika literally getting on an airplane, he was in his 70s at the time, and talking to every single librarian he could, he could meet. Um, they have brief descriptions of some of the manuscripts, but really a minority of them. Um, where do they get their descriptions from? There's nobody sitting in the FGP office actually writing these descriptions. They get their descriptions from two places. One is library catalogs, already existing library catalogs. What they do is they simply pull the information in that libraries already have. In most cases, libraries have not um, gone very far in cataloging their Geniza manuscripts, but obviously having all the library catalogs together is a huge advantage. And the second way they get their information is crowdsourcing. So if you're on the FGP website and you say, oh, I know exactly what this is, you can write a note and attach it to the manuscript image on the site so that other scholars can see your identification of it with your name on it, which is, which was, a, nobody had ever done this in Geniza studies before. They have bibliographic references, so let's say you're sitting in the Bodleian Library in Oxford and you see a fantastic document and you really wanna publish it, but you have to find out has anyone published this before? You can go to FGP, click on the document, and it shows you the bibliography. A huge benefit for scholarship. And finally, they have um, developed software that enables scholars, or I should say facilitates, the finding of joins. So I'm going to um, show you how the joining software works. That will be um, the final part of my talk because it's, it's quite wonderful and quite miraculous. And when this joining software first came out three years ago, most of us literally could not believe our eyes. Essentially what the, the FGP did was they took 
facial recognition software. And they put it into a series of algorithms. So let's say you're buying a book on Amazon, right? So you buy your book, and then up pops something that says, people who bought this book also, like you may also be interested in the following books, right? So it's that kind of an algorithm. Um, Facebook has similar algorithms. If you like something, Facebook is more likely to put into your feed things that are similar to it according to Facebook's algorithm. So they combined those kinds of algorithmic techniques with mapping the manuscript in terms of text density and layout. It would have been completely useless to map the documents in terms of shape because documents decay. and You can have a big hole right, between two documents of a, or two parts of a join. So they weren't looking at shape. They were looking simply at the distribution of ink on the page. So I'm going to show you how this works, but first I just want to tell you how, um, how it used to work in the old school. Um, back before this, finding joins depended entirely on memory. Obviously, you had to have a very, very good visual memory in order to be able to find a join. I discovered in working on this material that visual memory does improve. I have a terrible visual memory and no sense of direction, consequently. I'm often laughed at by my friends. Um, I was once driving uh, north on the Pacific Coast Highway in California. Adam, you'll know what I'm talking about. Literally, you have the ocean on your left and you have land on your right. And we stopped for about 15 minutes and I got back in the car and I proceeded to drive in the wrong direction. That's how bad my visual memory is. But it has improved thanks to my work on the Geniza. I'll get back to that in a second. So if you happen to have a very poor visual memory like me, um, this is a very, very helpful kind of software. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a successful example uh, of the join software. This happens to be the very first thing I ever put into the join software and it was like, wow, this really works. Let's say you have half a document. So in this case, we're looking at a Qadi court decision resolving a dispute between two Jews. It's actually kind of a nice case because there was a Jewish physician who was banished from his synagogue and this made him so angry that he decided to sue the rabbi in a Qadi court. And the decision says, yes, rabbi, you have to let the physician back into your synagogue. So it's a really, it's a kind of nice case for social historians. But unfortunately, we only have half of it. So what do you do? So you take the shelf mark, you plug it in to the Fried Friedberganiza project. It tells you that yes, there is an image of this that exists. You have a number of options. You can look at images, you can look at identifications, cataloging records, bibliography. They have very few transcriptions. And then you go down and you see joins suggestions. So you click on that. So I'm going to keep you in suspense just for a moment and tell you. Um, there's a very, very technical um, paper about how you identify, how, what the algorithms really are. I don't understand a word of this, um, but I do know that. Uh, computer vision is one of the most important and rapidly developing areas of computer science today. There is an international journal of computer vision where um, a number of people, you can see Jakob Schweika's name at the end, um, published the algorithms. This is what they look like. Some of you may actually understand what this means. I don't. Um, and effectively what they've done is developed three separate algorithms. So you see the tabs there. I have one of the tabs circled. But in fact, there are three algorithms, one per tab. So the first algorithm yielded some very interesting looking documents. Um, I can see already that there is an Ottoman document. That's the first one that you see there. Um, there is what's probably a Fatimid um, Qadi court document. Very, very interesting material, but nothing to do with my manuscript. So then, and you have to imagine I'm sitting on my couch, right? And I'm, and I'm just kind of experimenting with this and saying, oh, let's see if we can find another half. Second algorithm, look at that. And so there we were, able to see the document as its own scribe saw it. Uh, a document that will never be reunited in physical reality was able to be reunited because of 
uh, machine learning and digital imaging. Super fun. Um, but, you knew there was a but. Um, I am no techno-messianist, meaning I don't think that all problems can be solved by technology. There are some limitations of the automated method of finding joins. So one of the most serious limitations is false positives. So remember back here, I looked at a number of suggestions. All in all, there were maybe 300 suggestions that I went through, only one of which was actually correct, right? So false positives are simply inherent in the problem. The algorithm is not that specific. The machine doesn't actually learn um, anymore because they ran this algorithm at one point and what you're getting is the pre-selected results of the algorithm. Um, and more, actually let me show you another example of false positives and you can see how this works. So um, this is a fragment of a letter from some high Fatimid official. Um, I can tell by the script and by the line spacing. And it's been reused for a text in Hebrew script. Now, you don't have to actually know any languages to understand that these are not joins. These are clearly things from completely different, um, different manuscripts. The more serious problem is that when FGP originally ran the computer algorithms, they input the images as a combination, an amalgam of recto and verso. If you're dealing with a literary text, if you're dealing with a book where the recto and the verso are by the same scribe and look the same, that's completely fine. But if you're dealing with a document where the recto and the verso are often by completely different scribes, it's a serious problem, a serious limitation. Digital tools have a history. They're invented for particular purposes. They're invented by particular people with particular interests in mind. They all have limitations. This is not specific to FGP. So the moral of the story is, for any digital database that you use, PGP, FGP, something in a completely different field, you always need to be aware of the limitations, right? There are strengths and there are weaknesses. So the, 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 I would call them, I wouldn't call them disadvantages, I would call them peculiarities. Um, of the FGP algorithms is the problem of false positives and the literary bias. So how can we take those disadvantages or those peculiarities and turn them into advantages? Well, it turns out that false positives can actually be an advantage because you're looking at a lot of new material, constantly casting your eyes over texts. And whether you're conscious of it or not, you're making judgments about them. Is this Hebrew script or Arabic script? Is this scribbling, or does it actually look interesting? Is this a chancery hand? Is it a fiscal hand? Is this a personal letter? Is it a provincial scribe writing in an archaic way? Is it a trained professional? Is it a draft, or is it the real thing? Was it folded? Does it have signatures? You're constantly processing manuscripts in your own computer, um, which is your brain, and ultimately you're constructing a series in your head and seeing that much material inevitably helps. So what I discovered after three years of working with the join finder and having uh, not that much success and a lot of frustration is that I myself was actually able to make joins the old fashioned way much more easily. My visual memory had improved and not only that, my sense of direction had improved, which was the kind of you know, most bizarre result of all. There's a scientific reason for this, which is that the area of the brain called the hippocampus, which is responsible for visual processing, including sense of direction, is the one area of the brain that can actually add new, neural, new, new um, brain cells and new neurons um, and neural pathways. The classic example of this is London taxi drivers. So some 
neurologist decided it would be interesting to do an MRI on London taxi drivers before they memorize all the street names in London, and then after they've memorized them and passed their exam to be taxi drivers. And what they discovered is that their hippocampuses were working um, much, much more and much more efficiently. So you have the, the popular version of the story on the BBC, and then you have the technical uh, scientific version. So using the algorithms can actually help you to, um, to make joins yourself and also to find your way around California. Um, okay, so to, to conclude, uh, technology itself cannot solve scholarly problems. You need both artisanal methods, the old-fashioned way, and automated methods. As a scholar, you should always be looking at manuscripts and reading texts all the time because that's the way you improve. And eventually, the visual skills will come. You'll find after, say, five, 10 years of working on this material that you can date manuscripts just by looking at them. Right? So I will look at something now. I know if it's Ottoman. I know if it's Mamluk. That wasn't true in the beginning. Most of all, we need to go to the meta level in thinking about what it is that we're doing when we're exercising the technical aspects of our craft. Technique is not only technique. No tool is objective. And in order to really understand what these tools are, there has to be constant communication among scholars and between scholars and programmers. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to take questions from the audience. Uh, we have some time before we um, serve coffee and tea and stuff like this. Who would like to start? Professor Hurley? Oh, sorry. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, madam, and thank you very, very much for a most helpful, informative, and very inspiring lecture. Um, I uh, wanted to ask two questions. One, um, uh, do we have anything in the Gariza that would be books that you would have lost otherwise? I mean, books that are original to them, especially that 89% of, of, of the documents were books. Um, and secondly, since most of it comes from the, uh, the centuries that you mentioned, from the Fatimid period and the Ayyubid period, why is it that we tend to have things written in Latin, even though uh, even the nearest thing, the Byzantian Empire, was, was pretty much dealing in Greek? So how did that come about, that we have uh, Latin, things written in Latin script in the Gariza documents uh, in these periods? You, you talk even faster. Wait, don't, oh, before you take the mic, you talk even faster than I do. Can, it's the excitement, of course, yes. Can, can, you, uh, can you repeat your first question? My first question was whether we do have books that, uh, that, um, uh, that we would not have been able to, to possess were it not for the Geniza. I mean, books that, um, um, yes, that would, would have been lost otherwise. Ah, yes, okay, excellent. Thank you very much for these questions. So the first question, do, have books been found in the Geniza that were not preserved outside the Geniza? And the answer is yes, many, many, many books. Um, there are entire treatises of philosophy, astronomy, medicine, grammar, all of the medieval sciences that have appeared in the Geniza, some of them written in Arabic and copied into Hebrew characters. So um, it's, this is actually not an area that has been worked on very much. Um, if I could clone myself, I would send another Marina Rusto off to do that kind of thing, but unfortunately that's not yet possible. Um, but it's a, it's a wide open area for research. An even more interesting, to my mind, um, piece of that is versions of texts that we thought we knew and understood. But once the versions from the Geniza come out, we have to completely rethink what we thought we knew. So I'll give you an example of this, which is, um, it's, a, it's an important text for the history of Geniza studies because it was the text that two Methodist sisters who were traveling in Cairo in the 1890s brought back to Cambridge to, sh to show Solomon Schechter. And they said, this is very important. And Schechter looked at it and said, yes, it is very important. I'm going to Cairo. What the text that they showed him was, was a 10th century fragment of a biblical book that had been declared outside the canon by the rabbis. So you will not find this book in any Hebrew Bible. 
you will find it in a Catholic Bible. It's the book of Ecclesiasticus, or Ben Sira. And there was a big debate in the 1890s among biblical scholars about whether Ben Sira had been written in Greek or Hebrew. And it looked like the Greek camp was winning until this fragment was discovered. And this fragment made it clear that not only was Ben Sira originally written in Hebrew, but that Jews were reading Ben Sira a thousand years after it had been declared to be uncanonical. So just one example among many. To your second question, why is there Latin in the Geniza? Not only is there Latin, there's Judeo-Latin, which I particularly like. Um, so the, the way the demographics worked is that around 1250, so at the very beginning of the Mamluk period, there was a shift in the demography of Fustat, where people moved north towards Cairo in the direction of the citadel. And gradually, Cairo became englobed into this larger metropolis that we now know and love and many of you live in. Um, what that meant is that with the shift in population northward, um, there were fewer people attending the synagogue. And so you have a kind of dip in the number of manuscripts preserved from the Mamluk period. Um, towards the late Mamluk period, and then especially um, in the early Ottoman period in the 16th century, you have another surge in population in that particular neighborhood. And by that point, the Jewish population of Cairo had been augmented by many, many refugees and exiles from Spain. And it was the Spanish refugees who brought lots and lots of Latin texts with them, and also wrote Castilian texts, either in Hebrew characters or in Latin characters. For reasons that nobody has yet explained, the earliest known text in Yiddish, which is the language that was spoken by uh, the Jews of medieval and early modern Germany, uh, sorry, uh, Europe, um, so in other words, it originated as a German a medieval German dialect and gradually spread eastward into mostly Slavic-speaking territory. The earliest Yiddish text that has ever been found was found in the Cairo Geniza, and it's from the 13th century. So you had a lot of migration. This is a very geographically mobile community, and if they were getting to India, chances are they were also getting to Europe. First of all, thank you very much for the lecture. I very much enjoyed it. Um, I have a question that might sound naive because I'm not very much knowledgeable on the, on the subject. Yet, I don't understand why you said that the Cairo Geniza has documents that cover a period of almost a thousand years. So I don't understand why someone or a group of people would want to gather all these documents, even doodles and drawings. Like, for example, today, um, we do not like gather documents or papers from everyone and just put them in a, in a place so people who would come years later would see them. We have the internet, I know, but nobody's interested in such a thing. So I don't understand why someone would have this interest to collect all this information and find them in a single place where we can have access to them, if you can answer me. Excellent. Um, so the question you're asking is not why people put things in the Geniza, but rather why are we as historians bothering to go and study Geniza documents? Did I understand correctly? Both, okay, good. So, so let me take the first question first, which is why did people just put anything in the Geniza? Sometimes it's the seemingly naive questions that are not naive at all, because this is a question to which we all thought we knew the answer until you scratch the surface and you realize we really don't know the answer to this question. So Goytain used to say that there were uh, superstitious beliefs about the destruction of Hebrew text. You never wanted to destroy anything in Hebrew, but that when you, when you would throw your, your texts away, you wouldn't, I mean, who wants to like sort through texts that you're gonna throw away? You just put everything in, right, without sorting it out. When I actually began to look into why Goytain thought this, it turns out that he was basing his information on the practices of a single Jewish community in 19th century Jerusalem that had been studied by anthropologists. Um, Mark Cohen and Yadida Stillman had the same question, and they went and conducted ethnographic research among 
anybody they could find who was Jewish and grew up somewhere in the Arabic speaking world. And what they discovered is that there were as many customs of Geniza as there were Jewish communities, meaning there are lots of different interpretations of this rule against the destruction of Hebrew script. Why this community saved everything, nobody has yet been able to explain. Of course, we're very grateful that they did, but we don't exactly know what was motivating them. And maybe they weren't motivated by one motive. Maybe there were different reasons depending on the time, the place, and the person. In terms of why we want to know about it, so one of the um, dangers of giving a lecture on a technical subject is that I've barely even explained to you why anyone should care about these documents. So for that, um, how many hours do you have? No. Uh, so one piece of that I'm going to be explaining in my Tuesday lecture. Um, but just to give you the kind of, that's like a specific thing, let me give you the overview, which is this was a, um, a period in Middle Eastern history that had only been understood from the perspective of power, of the center, of the state. So chroniclers who wrote chronicles close to the courts of caliphs and sultans, um, the literate elite. Remember I was saying we didn't know about women or children. So if you want to understand how a society functioned and how it reproduced itself, you can't just study the male elite. I'm not, this is not a feminist point, right? This is a historical point, which is you literally don't understand a society unless you understand the whole society and not just a tiny, a tiny part of it. Um, some people would say you can't even understand what was going on at the courts of caliphs until you understand the system of taxation and land tenure. Where was all that money coming from that was buying the fancy things that you read about, um, you know, gifts between different officials and stuff like that? How did they have money to do this? Where was that money coming from? And how do we know and understand unless we can see the taxes actually being collected at the collection point? Right? What is it like for somebody in the 11th century to have the tax collector come to their door, knock on it, and say, I'm not leaving until you render your taxes? Right? And then the person says, I have, no, I have no money. What am I going to do? And they sit there and they negotiate. Or the person goes to jail. How do they get out of jail? These kinds of basic, seemingly simple questions about how did this really work are sometimes the most difficult for historians to answer and also sometimes the most important. I always thought that the Geniza was because uh, in all these manuscripts, the name of God was in, in some, some part written and it was forbidden to, uh, uh, to throw it away. This is why they kept it in the Geniza. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The second thing, uh, was this uh, uh, custom just for the Oriental Jews or uh, did you find any uh, uh, sort of Geniza in Europe. Third thing, uh, we have, we have, I think, we have uh, lots of Geniza documents in the National Archive. Uh, I know that they are not uh, uh, yet digitalized. Why don't you, uh, as you have the means, do a project with the National Archive, Princeton University, and put them in the light because I think that will help a lot. Nothing would make me happier. Um, and I mean, we can talk seriously about that. Okay, so to go in order, the name of God, this is again one of those um, pieces of information that gets circulated about the Geniza, that manuscripts went into the Geniza because they could potentially contain the name of God in Hebrew characters, and that's something that you never want to destroy. When you actually look into the Geniza, you, you see that the evidence actually doesn't support this reading, that there are many, many texts in the Geniza that do not have the name of God. But even more than that, I have a colleague in Paris, Judith Alshovi Schlanger, who discovered a palimpsest, which was a biblical Hebrew text with the name of God erased and another Hebrew text written over it. So if there were at least some Jews who were willing to erase biblical text containing the name of God, then clearly not everybody thought that the name of God couldn't be destroyed. So this is really the difference between the approach of, like the old school approach was, what do the rabbinic texts say, right? My approach as a social historian is, what do the people do? 
right? So, so that's, uh, it's, it turns out it's a much more complicated and much more interesting story than we believed. Um, the question of, was it just uh, Middle Eastern Jews who practiced this custom? It wasn't. Um, you know, Egypt obviously has preserved much more than most places, so that was particularly fortunate. Um, the question of the practices of Geniza among European Jews um, is something that nobody actually understands very well. Um, and part of the reason for that is that so little has actually survived from Europe, partly because of the persecution of Jews in Europe in the Middle Ages. There were many manuscripts that were burned um, by the church over the years. Um, but perhaps just as interestingly, there's a project now to go into the bindings of books in European libraries of old manuscripts. And what's being pulled out is when you, when you bind a book in the Middle Ages and in the early modern period, you're basically making cardboard by sandwiching together paper, parchment, anything you can find. And if you can convince librarians to let you dissect their book covers from the 15th, 16th, 17th century, what you find is many fragments of much older Hebrew manuscripts. So this is a project that has been titled the European Geniza. Now, it's not a Geniza, in fact. It's something quite different. But you can see that the word Geniza has gained a certain you know, sort of uh, recognizability. And so people are, are using that name for it. But as far as the actual practice of depositing texts in a particular place, we don't know anything before about the 17th century. That doesn't mean they didn't do it. It just means we don't know. Um, your third question, yeah. I mean, digitizing. So, it's been very unclear to me um, as I've worked on, on this material over the last 20 years exactly what remains in Egypt from the Cairo Geniza. Um, one of the reasons that I've started coming more frequently to Cairo is precisely so that I can explore this. And if it's at all possible to do a collaboration, I will certainly facilitate it. Um, we know that um, every uh, one and then when the, the closet were they used to put the Geneza the, uh, had been emptied and they are burying it in, uh, in the cemetery. So uh, do you think that uh, there is a missing period uh, that can indicate that there is a still um, a buried Geniza that we don't know where it is? This is an excellent question. You're talking about Al-Basatin, yeah? Okay, that's right. So there were um, Geniza-like texts that were um, excavated from Basatin and also from the perimeter of the synagogue courtyard um, itself. And um, what is the relationship between that and this practice of putting things in this chamber? Again, no one has ever actually been able to explain this. There doesn't seem to be a logic of it was a certain era, like there was a decade when they were burying things in Al-Basatin, and then you know, there's this missing decade from the Geniza. There, there isn't a logic to it that I know of. Um, I think the way, I would say, I mean, I could be wrong about this, but you know, ask me in 10 years. The way I would explain this now is to say there were many, many different practices. There wasn't just one way of discarding manuscripts. So there must have been some group of Jews to whom it was important to actually bury the stuff, which is another attested method of, um, of, uh, of depositing manuscripts. Uh, thank you for this uh, fascinating uh, lecture. Um, I would like to come back to the first question about uh, the 89% of uh, documents, I mean the books. Uh, do you know someone who will work on it? Is there a classification of the book uh, which are available? Uh, did the Islamic studies, for example, from Oxford uh, got involved in this project? So um, you're asking about the, the codicological classifications, the book and the scroll and the rotulus? Yes. So this is um, someone in Paris at the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes, um, Judith Olshovich-Langer. I can give you the name afterwards. Um, and she works on all kinds of uh, Jewish books in the Middle Ages, not just the Geniza. But for her, the Geniza solved a number of problems. Um, it solved the problem of, let's say you're looking at a text, right? Like I can, one of the ones that I showed you, for example, this Iraqi legal text from the 8th century in an 11th century copy, the one with the seven-part join that I showed you. 
There we go. So my colleague who was looking for this text is called the Sheitot. I told you he found 120 fragments of it, and this is just seven of them. The thing about this version of the text is that it's crazy. The passages are completely out of order, and it didn't make any sense to him. If he were doing a traditional, this is gonna get a little technical, forgive me, but if he were doing a 19th century critical edition of this manuscript, this version, this witness, would have been a complete outlier, and he would not have known what to do with it. But then, Judith Elshobi Schlanger came along and said, oh, that's a rotulus. That means it was an informal text, never meant to circulate. It was only meant for his personal consumption, so he felt the freedom to copy this text in a crazy way, with a passage from here, a passage from there, kind of a pastiche, right? We would never have understood this had this scholar, Judith Elshobi Schlanger, not systematically studied what was on these rotuli. So um, I can give you some references for her work afterwards if you're, if you're interested. It, was, it goes to show that when you pay attention to the physical qualities of the text that you're working on, you can learn a lot. It's not just about studying the text. You also have to study the physicality, the paper, the ink, the layout, the format, and so forth. The karait, they always do things different. So you're saying they have their own geniza also? Yeah. This is a very interesting question. So um, I was saying that there are three different types of Jewish community in all these medieval cities, and one of them are the Karaites. Um, so there are 16,000, I think, manuscripts, and I'm talking now about actual books, multi-page books, usually not fragments, in St. Petersburg that were brought there by a Russian collector in the middle of the 19th century named Avram Firkovich. He got them from what he called the Geniza of one of the Karaite synagogues in Cairo. Um, he also went to many other synagogues at other places in the Middle East, but this particular collection, his second collection, was only from Cairo. The community would actually use um, the term Geniza. However, this Geniza had shelves, right? So, which suggests it was much more of a library. Um, I would not say that the Karaites had a different custom. I would say that this particular synagogue had a library that they called a geniza. That's as much as we can say. Um, whether, now, in fact, you find a lot of Karaite material in this geniza, which suggests that Karaites also observed the same custom, and some of them were actually using the rabbinite geniza. You can ask me anything. Well, I, I've got a question. So, um, just, I mean, essentially, it's, I mean, it's not clear from the talk today, but let me just try and bring this out. I mean, you are essentially, you have two academic specialties. I mean, you are essentially uh, uh, have a specialization in the Geniza, but then also in medieval Islamic history. So, which came first? Ah, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I was trained as a Jewish historian. Uh, and I was trained as a cultural historian, not a social historian. So mostly what I did in graduate school was I read rabbinic texts. At some point, my advisor said to me, you should look at the Karaites. I said, okay. And from the Karaites, I got to the Geniza. And from the Geniza, I got to social history. I really wanted to write like grassroots history from the ground up. And then I began to ask myself a question. I said, if I'm a social historian, why am I only looking at one tiny, part of the population. It's not enough just to look at the Jews. I have to look at the whole society. Around the same time, I, so I, for years I was unable to answer this question and I said, okay, you know, let me just do what I'm doing. Um, and then I began to find more and more Arabic script material in the Geniza that had nothing whatsoever to do with Jews. So um, one I published in 2010 from the Bodleian Library in Oxford, it's a petition written to the sister of the caliph al-Hakim, Sitt al-Mulk. We know from the chronicle of al-Musabbihi that Sitt al-Mulk received petitions. But knowing from a chronicler that she received petitions and holding in your hands one of the petitions that she received is a completely different story. And at that point I said, I want to work on these Arabic texts. I began to find more and more of them and what they enabled me to do was to understand this question that I talked about before of like, how did, these, how did this actually work? To understand the how to, the how did this actually work 
questions um, about the Fatimid state. How did the Fatimids actually govern? What happened when they came to Egypt in 969? How did they win the loyalty of the local population? There are answers to these questions in the Arabic documents of the Geniza. And at that point, I kind of took the turn. I had had training in Middle Eastern history, of course, because you can't study just the Jews and not know something about the society. So I had read um, the usual things that you read when you're studying Middle Eastern history, chronicles and stuff like that. And you know, I knew how to read an Arabic text. Um, but nobody ever told me that this existed and, uh, and once I found out that it existed, I just decided this is what I'm going to do now. Good. Are there any more questions? Actually, Adam, if you don't mind, I'm just going to add one thing. Yeah. What I also discovered, <laughs> I don't want to keep people, but, but what I also discovered in working on the Arabic script texts is that the Hebrew script text actually helped me to understand the Arabic script text. So it's not like I turned my back on Jewish history and said, I'm not gonna do that anymore. When you read, you, you can read letters in Judeo-Arabic saying, I went and I tried to get uh, a document from the chancery in Cairo that would give me permission to um, found my own synagogue or something like that. And I couldn't find the right person because the emir wasn't there that day. And so then I talked to this other guy and he brought me to the emir. And then the emir was able to put me in touch with the right person who actually had the document written for me. I mean, it's priceless, but if you didn't know Judeo-Arabic, you wouldn't have that whole kind of background story. No, no, I think it's better with the mic. Uh, I have another question. So w when you look at these documents, all of them, don't you have this question in mind that might this specific document be like a fake one? Might this person have played history for a specific reason? Uh, might someone intentionally told the story in a different way so that he deceives us? Because all I think of is that we look at these, I, I know and I believe that they give uh, a sense of what the time had been and what people are. But I guess that they somehow distort the image. And when we look at them, we just like, this is a historical document. It might have told something. And we just sometimes we overanalyze. And maybe it was just a text. Maybe someone just intended to put it there so they would, for their personal gain then or, or something. Good. Yeah, this is also a very interesting question that historians have tried to answer in lots of different ways. So um, when you're looking at a text, you have to decide a couple of things. One, is it real? Is it an original, right? Is this actually a document that somebody wrote for a real purpose as opposed to for the purposes of deception? There's a whole science called diplomatics, which was developed um, in the early modern period in Europe precisely in order to distinguish um, real Latin documents from forged Latin documents. Um, diplomatists have methods for doing this. Um, I spent a few years studying these for precisely this purpose. One of the difficulties about finding forgeries, and my colleague at Princeton, Anthony Grafton, has written about this, is that forgers, in some cases, are the most expert scribes because they have to know exactly what to do to make it look real. There's a document um, in Arabic from the Fatimid period, it's a Qadi court document, talking about a forger, saying, uh, you know, we, we, we got a document from this guy and then it turned out that, like he's talking to the, to the Qadi and he's saying, we got a document from some guy and it turns out that he'd been forging documents for all these people. Um, now what do we do? Um, so we know that the phenomenon existed. I have never found a document that I believe to be forged I have found documents that I thought were maybe drafts that were never sent. And there is a way of distinguishing drafts from like a real text that was sent. You can see a draft of a letter, it doesn't have any folds, it doesn't have an address on the back. You can see a draft of a legal document, um, it's not from a notebook, it's a single sheet and it has no signatures. So clearly this wasn't for a real court case, it was just practice. Um, but before we even get to the question of forgeries, there's another question to ask, which was implicit in your question, which is just because you're looking at a document doesn't mean that it's telling you some kind of unvarnished truth, right? People tell stories. So for example, when you're reading a petition to Situl Mulk and it says, um, 
There's a second one that I haven't published yet. It's in New York, and it's a wonderful story. It's a guy in the Fayum who says, I sent my son with 100 dinar to Medina to Fayum to buy 70 sacks of grain. And once he bought the grain, the Amir took it. Can you please get it back for me? Right? So, and then he says, because I'm such a poor man and I have so many mouths to feed and so forth. And you say to yourself, if you're such a poor man, what are you doing with 100 dinars? Right? So, in other words, there's a lot of rhetoric that goes into crafting the stories in court documents, in letters. So you have to come to these texts with the same skepticism that you would use for any text from the period for a chronicle, you name it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thinking back to the list of languages that you said that were present in, in the Geniza, and also thinking about Egypt as being a, probably a majority Christian country, at least through the high period of the dense uh, collection that you have in the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries, um, what about Coptic and what's going on with that? And if there isn't Coptic, what does that absence tell us? Absolutely. Um, there is some Coptic in the Geniza. You would expect much more. Um, the, most of the Coptic that you find um, are the numerals. So Coptic alpha numerals was in fact how Jews wrote numbers in all of their accounts and other, any kind of document that deals seriously with numbers. Um, so obviously, you know, people were aware that there was this, you know, pre-existing writing system and they were using it. I mean, you know, it's Greek characters um, and people were learning it. Um, we also see many Christians appearing in Geniza documents. So given all that, why is it that we don't have more texts in Coptic? Um, again, this is uh, one of the questions that's just very, very difficult to answer. There's a complex element of this as well, because with the exception of Cambridge, many of the Geniza collections were handpicked from dealers. And it's quite likely that when libraries went to buy manuscripts in Egypt from the Geniza, they were only looking for Hebrew. So for all we know, there could have been lots of Coptic and it just kind of went somewhere else. Um, so it's, it's complex. Um, the moral of the story is you can't always answer questions about the social history of the Middle Ages based on the patterns of deposit in the Geniza because there are many complex interventions along the way. Anyone else have a question? Otherwise, I will then uh, we'll let Professor Rosta rest a bit. Um, there's going to be some coffee, tea, and snacks outside. Uh, just remind you all that Professor Rosta will be giving another lecture uh, Tuesday, 6 p.m. in this hall on recycled uh, Fatimid state documents. Um, and other than that, I just want to thank you all very much. Uh, those of you who've registered for the workshop will take a break and have some snacks, and then we'll reconvene uh, once the room has been reset up. Thank you all very much for coming, and thank you, Professor Rosta. Thank for your you. Life.